Welcome to another life-impacting message from City Light Church. You can find more great content like this online at citylight.church. Open up scripture today. We are in our series through Romans 8. So in Romans 8, we have been for the last three weeks. It will be for the next six weeks. And what we want to do is uh, really delve into what's been called the greatest chapter of the Bible. Uh, Perhaps the greatest chapter of the greatest book of the Bible, although as we know, we love Scripture. All of Scripture is God-breathed. All of Scripture uh, is good for us, profitable for us, for teaching and reproof, correction, and even rebuke. Uh, We see in Scripture, all of Scripture, the character of God. We see in Scripture His plan for the world and even His plan for us, how He wants to relate to us, how we have turned from Him and how He came for us and how in the person and work of Jesus did everything necessary to redeem us to relationship with him, that he has a plan and a purpose for each one of us, but also for his church, us collectively in the world and has us here uh, for that reason, even now to be his light in the world. And so we see all of this in scripture. Uh, Nevertheless, Romans is kind of a condensation of all of Scripture. And Romans 8, again, another condensation of the condensation of Romans, of the condensation of Scripture, which is why we're spending a couple of months in this book, in this letter to the Romans. Uh, So back in the day, before, in fact, even the first three years when we planted City Light Church, seven years ago, the first three years I worked full-time in radio. I I had worked in radio for about 15 years, radio, TV, those kinds of things. And uh, that was my that was my job, if you like, my profession. I always worked in the church alongside that in various roles and capacities until being called. And I was even led by the Holy Spirit to um, help plant this church. And uh, one of the things that I found really interesting over those 15 years, um, started off just doing like a volunteer nighttime weekday, zero listener um, community radio gig, uh, all the way through to breakfast show host and um, production manager, uh, content director, general manager, had a, like an internationally syndicated show, about five and a half million weekly listeners. Didn't matter where along that whole spectrum, uh, uh, thousands of interviews, every single person that I interviewed, from the local artist to the biggest names in the world, every single one of them would always cling to, hang their hat on, claim someone bigger than them as a friend, uh, someone that they had hung out with recently, someone they'd toured with, those kinds of things. So all the way up, people are claiming one extra thing as if they want to be known by that thing. And then one day I got to speak with uh, Bono, who, I mean, you, you may be a fan of him, you may be vaguely aware of him, but back around about eight years ago when I interviewed him, I thought, okay, surely that, that's the terminus. Bono is like, he's the, he's the top. He may not be your favourite musician, but he's the top of the musicians. Uh, Bono calls you, you say, yes, Bono, tell me what you'd like me to do. Anyway, so I had the opportunity to chat with him. And almost immediately, Bono starts saying things like, well, so I was hanging out with the Pope the other day. (laughs) Or you wouldn't believe it, hanging out with this president or this prime minister or this world leader or whatever. And I was like, man, even Bono is trying to claim somebody greater than himself in terms of, um, I don't know, goodness, greatness by association, these kinds of things. Someone to not build your identity on necessarily, although for some, for sure, uh, but to associate with and somehow by association add to yourself. And somewhere in that 15 years of working in media, I realized that, man, we have the, the greatest relationship possible in the whole universe. The whole what manner of love the Father has given to us that we should be called the children of God and that is who we are. And that everybody, even Bono, at the top, still claiming other tops in other industries and other world leaders, other structures, other places. And yet here we are, children, daughters and sons of the living king of the universe, the one who like whispers and galaxies and billions of stars have no choice but to come into existence because of his power, his pure volition. Uh, we are his sons and his daughters. <clears throat> and yet I... I I don't fear, I know, that for many Christians, not just in Australia, not just in the West, not just in our day today, but for the last couple of thousand years, uh, we don't necessarily live in light of who we are in Christ in terms of our relationship with the Father. If we did, if this was our, if we knew, like if we do know this conceptually, 
This is our primary relationship. Our identity completely stems from what God thinks and says about us and who we are to Him and even who we are in Him. And yet, in our daily life, I wonder how much of that primary relationship actually informs and directs our attitudes, our words, our relationships, our approach to work and vocation, our approach to finances, our approach to politics, our approach to our neighbours, our approach to our fellow brothers and sisters in Christ. And this is something that Paul is starting to get at here. He opens up this section with, so then, which means we've, we've traveled a distance already. We've looked at the last three weeks through Romans 8, starting at the beginning, obviously. And even at the beginning of Romans 8, he starts with a therefore, hearkening back to the earlier chapters or the earlier parts of this letter to the Roman church meaning that he's building this like cogent argument, this logical progression throughout the letter and not so much culminating but climaxing here in chapter 8, showing us what it means to live a life empowered by the Holy Spirit, informed by who we are in Christ. So then, because of all these things, brothers and sisters, my family in Jesus, we are not obligated to the flesh to live according to the flesh. Your version might say, we are debtors, but not to the flesh. Yes, we're debtors. Yes, we owe something. Like, we have not achieved this thing on our own, but not to the flesh. We looked at this over the last three weeks. Those that live according to the flesh have their minds set on the things of the flesh, which leads to death. In fact, man, he goes on to explicitly say, if you live according to the flesh, you will die we're not obligated to the flesh. We're not beholden to our fleshly desires. Because of the Holy Spirit in us, we can choose to do the things that are pleasing to God. He goes on to say again, because if you live according to the flesh, you are going to die. This is a very, I mean, it's a very direct thing for Paul to write, to say. If you do this, you will die. And of course, he doesn't necessarily mean that will lead to a physical death. Like if you pursue the things of the flesh, if you live for yourself, if you live your life abstract of the Holy Spirit, abstract of Christ's finished work, abstract of God's will for your life, it doesn't mean that that will necessarily mean that uh, a series of events will occur which will lead to your demise physically. But what he's saying is uh, you remain in your spiritual death. And at the resurrection of the judgment, you don't go on to life, you go on to eternal death. This is not just some sky-bound father figure trying to stop you from having fun. This isn't the God that you sometimes hear about, maybe from mates or neighbours or in the media, trying to prevent you from fulfilling your deepest desires. As if God, in fact, I mean, I hear this in the church. People say, oh, this is what I would really love to do. And people say, oh, don't say that out loud because, you know, God won't give it to you then. As if God is somehow some maniac who his, his joy is wrapped up in your lack of joy or trying to mess around with you. No, what Paul is trying to say here is it's a rescue mission. You're on this trajectory to death, actually. And if you live in accordance with the flesh, you will hurtle straight to death. Uh, Owen, John Owen famously said, be killing sin or sin be killing you. Saying we're going to put to death the things of the flesh. In fact, he says, if you live according to the flesh, you're going to die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. So if you live according to the flesh, you're going to die. But... If by the Spirit, in the power and in the authority of the Holy Spirit, you put to death the deeds of the body, the desires of the flesh, which as we've seen in the last couple of weeks are completely antithetical to God's will for your life. Even the things that we think are good, the things that in our own fleshly wisdom, we would look and go, okay, this seems right to me. This seems good to me. This looks pleasing to the eye and looks like it will taste good. I sound familiar to you when we operate in the power of the flesh. If by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. 
He's trying to contrast the way that leads to life with the way that leads to death. He's done this, I mean, the whole time, all of Romans 8 thus far. So he's, man, this is the fruit of a life lived according to the flesh. This is the fruit of a life lived according to the Spirit. This is, the, this is what the mindset of the flesh looks like. It's, it's death. This is what the mindset of the Spirit looks like. It's life and it's peace. And so he continues this contrast. The life lived according to the flesh with the life lived in accord with the Spirit. Do this and you will live. How do you do this? What does that mean? What does it look like? What does it mean to buy the Spirit, put to death the deeds of the flesh? What does this even mean? I know, I mean, I know, I have experienced this. I am sure if you have thought about this at all, you would have experienced this. It's difficult to trust God. Because what you have is your, all your faculties, your senses. You have your eyes, you have your ears, you have your heart, which tells you a certain thing. You have your feet, even as you walk down whatever path is in front of you. Uh, you can tell if it's undulating or if it's rocky or, or if, it's, if it's getting narrow or getting what you like. You have these senses to help you navigate through life. And if we're not in accordance with the Spirit, if we're not in tune with the Spirit, if we're not in step with the Spirit, it's so much easier for us to trust our own capacity, our own control, our own senses of these things. Uh, I was talking with uh, Steve, actually, earlier today, and he said, you know what this reminds me of? A friend of mine who used to be a pilot instructor, and he would say, what would happen is, <clears throat> when you were out at night, uh, the pilots would, if they were ever to trust their own faculties and instincts over their instruments, over the things in front of them that were there to tell them objectively, this is the truth of the situation. If they didn't trust those things, it was perilous for them. In fact, at least one pilot died, not realizing he was inverted and went straight into the ocean. His instrumentation told him, you're inverted, uh, but he trusted what he could see. So often with us, we don't want to trust God. We're like, God, I know you, again, I know you are completely volitional. I know I have this like, intellectual idea this abstract idea of you as almighty, all-powerful, and even maybe loving towards me, and that you have my best interest at heart, that you're working you know, all things together for my good, and yet, from my perspective, I don't see that. So I'm just going to like wrench control back of the like steering wheel of my life, and I want to plow ahead under my own control, because I can see what's going on. And at least then, like, you know, I, can, I can pivot or maneuver or adjust as I go, not realizing that as a psalmist talks about God and his word, that his word is a lamp unto my feet. It's a light unto my path. And if we trust our sight, if we trust our ears, trust, I mean, God forbid, trust our heart, uh, it will lead us off of the path. If we trust the lamp, if we trust God, in fact, if we trust God even with us, his Holy Spirit, then uh, we can stay on that path. Trust the Spirit, not the flesh. So how he put to death the things of the flesh? I mean, God gave us um, the, the armor of God. He gave us the breastplate of righteousness, gave us the helmet of salvation, gave us the shield of faith with which to extinguish the flaming darts of the enemy, and he gave us the sword of of the Spirit, which is, again, the Word of God. <clears throat> what is our offensive weapon in the battle against the flesh and the enemy? Uh, it's the Word of God. How do we put to death the deeds of the flesh? It's not that we want to muster up our will. It's not that we want to... I mean, and some of these things can be helpful as well. It's not that we want to just get into a program. It's not that we want to get some coaches. It's not that we just want to try to, you know, again, uh, work ourselves up into, into some motivational uh, fervor to try to overcome these things because what the heart loves to do, we've seen already, is as soon as you overcome one thing of the flesh, in the flesh, another idol pops up. Another thing pops up. Another distraction pops up. Another deficiency pops up. Paul doesn't try, he's not putting the onus on you saying, 
you need to go figure it out. When you figure it out, then you come back to God and you'll be good enough for him. And he doesn't say that at all. He acknowledges in here, you cannot do this on your own. I can't do this on my own. It is by the power of the Holy Spirit that we can do these things. We can put to death the things of the flesh that lead to death. Be killing sin or sin be killing you. We don't get cute with sin. We don't want to just mitigate it. We don't want to sweep it under a rug. We don't want to just, you know, put it to the back of our mind or like, you know, push it deep, deep down and try not to think about it. Let's fester and grow. We want to kill it. We want to take our offensive weapon and cut it out of our lives. It's a serious, serious business. What else does Paul tell us here? This passage is showing us we have some level of partnership with the Spirit in His sanctifying work in our lives. We don't participate in our salvation except as glorious beneficiaries. Uh, We have as much to do with our salvation as the dead person on the ground has to do with their coming back to life uh, with the person performing CPR on them, which is to say nothing. Or as John Edwards put it, um, the only thing we bring to our salvation is the sin that made it necessary. That's That's what we contribute to our salvation, the sin that made our salvation necessary. But our sanctification... Paul is saying here, our sanctification, we actually partner with the Spirit in that work. We, we can rest in the finished work of Jesus. We don't contribute anything to our salvation. In fact, when we try to earn God's love, when we try to add to Jesus' finished work, when we try to, to like build on top of that to try to get God to love us, we actually prove we don't understand what Jesus has accomplished. We actually lose the freedom of the gospel when we think we have to try to contribute to our salvation. But we absolutely partner with the Spirit's work in us in conforming us to the likeness of Jesus. We are active participants, passive recipients of salvation, active participants in sanctification. We're becoming more like Jesus, living a life of freedom in Him, uh, in actively ourselves laying down the pursuits and the, the desires of the flesh. In fact, killing them, putting them to death. We don't just go, okay, well, Jesus, that work is done for me. So I'm just going to sit back and do whatever I want to do. And it doesn't matter anymore because my salvation is secure in Jesus. That's awesome. It's done. It's, it's a, that's a freebie. I'm just going to go and passively do nothing else. And if my life doesn't work out the way I want it to, or if I'm not becoming more like Jesus, uh, that's God's fault. That's not my fault. And yet Paul here is saying, actually, we, we bear some responsibility in our partnership with the Holy Spirit. We cannot do it without Him. But He, ple- he pleases to partner with us in His work in the world and His work even in our own lives. It is in the power of the Holy Spirit here that Paul says we can overcome the flesh. The Holy Spirit is mentioned like 20 times in his 39 verses. So every second verse, Paul is bringing us back to what is, how do we live this overcoming life? How do we do this? How do we attain life and peace? How do we, how do we live in the freedom in which, of which Christ has purchased for us? It's by the power of the Spirit. It keeps bringing us back to the Spirit. We need to choose to live congruently with your primary relationship, which is being a son or daughter of the king of the universe. He goes on, for or because. So all of these things, and now he wants to help you understand a little bit more why and how we can do these things. For you did not receive a spirit of slavery to fall back into fear. Instead, you received a spirit of adoption by whom we cry out, Abba, Father. Here he's saying you have received a spirit. God has gifted you His Holy Spirit. But it's not a spirit of fear. We don't relate to God as cowering enemies under the hand of a conquering king. He is a conquering king, but doesn't relate to us as enemies, but as a father because He's given us a spirit of adoption. So He's chosen intimacy with His enemies instead of enmity 
with his enemies. Or ad- advers- we're no longer his adversaries. <clears throat> in the Roman culture, so Paul's writing to these Romans, in the Roman culture, adoption was primarily done amongst adults. So when we think about adoption, we're thinking about primarily little kids. Um, does not happen, I mean, nearly enough in our culture. A few years ago, my wife and I, we wanted to adopt, could not get on a waiting list to do some training to get on another waiting list to potentially adopt a baby. I heard recently there was like one adoption in South Australia last year, other than uh, like you know, new families coming together and, and one partner adopting the kids of another partner or like a grandparent adopting, but two parents wanting to, like a husband and wife wanting to adopt a kid they don't know. One doesn't just barely happens, Tra- tragically. Anyway, I, we can't go into that. <clears throat> Adoption was mostly adults and mostly done by nobility, royalty, or very wealthy families or men, let's be honest, who wanted an heir. Even if they had other sons who would bear the family name and take on the legacy, if, those, if there was another person, maybe someone who worked for them, maybe even a slave or a servant or someone who, who again, was in their employ, who better embodied the character, the ethic of the king or, or noble or landowner, that person, that, that wealthy person could adopt that adult son, bring him into the family to help carry on the legacy of that person who's about to cark it. They would have equal rights with all of the other children. Those children could be 40, 50 years old and in comes this other person months before the old man carks it and he receives equal standing with the other children, equal share in the inheritance with the other children. This is different to how the Jews uh, in the time um, dealt with adoption where, or even inheritance where the eldest son would get a double portion of the inheritance. So say there were four kids, four sons, they would split it up five ways. Eldest son would get two portions of the inheritance. All the other sons would get one each. In Rome, it was, it was equal. Outstanding. And what Paul here is trying to impress upon his readers in Rome is that we benefit from the same kind of adoption that God has brought us into his family. Not because we embody his character. Quite the opposite. We are ill-deserving of this adoption. It's not that God looked at you and went, you're actually awesome. I want you in my family. Look at you. You're going to represent me so well in the world. You don't have to look back through, I mean, even just the world today, let alone the world throughout history, to know that we are just not, we're not great without the Spirit of God. But what God loves to do is bring you into his family and then, by the work of the Holy Spirit in you, conform you to the likeness of his son, Jesus. He does the work after adoption. He chooses you for his family when you are not just undeserving but ill-deserving. While you are still sinners, Christ died for us. It's amazing. I love the way Spurgeon put it. He said, I'm sure God chose me before I was born because he never would have chosen me after. I think, yeah, man, that's 100% true of me. He doesn't treat you. He doesn't relate to you in light of your sin. He relates to you in light of his son, Jesus. He's adopted you into his family because of what Jesus has done. He's given you his Holy Spirit because of what Jesus has done. And now you are the great beneficiaries of his adoption. He's brought you into his family. It's amazing. This is also why it says, for all those led by God's Spirit are God's sons. If you're a woman here, don't feel left out by that. What he's highlighting there is that you are an equal inheritor with all of the other brothers and sisters. This is actually a very elevating thing for women reading this in the day. So that you are a co- in fact, it goes on even to say it explicitly. It starts off with brothers and sisters, ends with you are co-heirs with Christ. It's amazing. It's phenomenal, actually. And he didn't give you the spirit of slavery, but his own spirit. The Spirit is a gift. The Spirit 
can't be earned, can't be bought, can't be purchased. There's no threshold of goodness that you like get over and then all of a sudden God says to you, you've made it. Congratulations, here have my spirit. I know the spirit is a gift from God. And uh, what it says is, here is all those led by the spirit. It means that because the spirit is a gift and because those who are led by the spirit, uh, it means that we don't need to manufacture an experience with the Holy Spirit. It means we don't need to like, again, whip ourselves up into some emotional frenzy to say that we have experienced the Holy Spirit. He's gifted us the Holy Spirit. Spirit, the Spirit is not something we earn. We can't, we don't, again, we don't um, will the Spirit to work in our lives. We partner with the Spirit and what the Spirit's already doing in our lives for sure. When he says all those led by the Spirit are God's sons, this is one of the most abused phrases in all of Western Christendom. I would I put it to you. I feel led by the Spirit, dot, dot, dot. Sometimes that's, that sentence ends really well. Sometimes that sentence ends in manipulation. Sometimes that sentence actually tries to baptize what the flesh wants and calls it a work of God. I think it's a, when, when, when we, need, we need to be cautious when we say, God told me this, or the Holy Spirit is leading me to this. It's not to say that the Spirit won't do that. We, we're reading here, the Spirit will lead you, wants to lead you, actually wants you to participate in His work in your life and in His work in the world. What we don't want to do is actually be operating out of the power of the flesh and calling it the power of the Spirit. I don't know if you've known people like this, that if it's something that they already want to do and they're keen to do it and they might say, I'll go pray about it and come back and every single time God happens to be 100% aligned with what they already wanted to do. Amazing how in tune they are with the Holy Spirit. Until those things prove not to be very helpful or not to represent Jesus very well. Far better for us, like the early Christians did, to say things like, it seems good to the Holy Spirit and to me that this. And in fact, we'll see later on in Romans 8, the more in step we are with the Holy Spirit, the clearer we learn to hear his voice, the more confidently we can say these things. We don't want to do ever because it leads to death is embrace the works of the flesh and call them the works of the spirit we need to be cautious about these things the spirit never disagrees with you never challenges you you may be again taking those things of the flesh and baptizing them in spiritual language then we get to one of the most encouraging verses in the bible it goes on the spirit himself testifies together with our spirit that we are God's children. <clears throat> again, here he, again, we've talked about this before, he's showing the Spirit is not just imper- some impersonal force. The Spirit is a person. The Spirit is uh, the third person of the Holy Trinity. He, he is a he, not an it. The Spirit himself testifies together with our spirit that we are God's children. This is amazing. And if you understand what's going on here, you, your, uh, I mean, your confidence, your joy, will increase for forever to the degree that you understand what's going on here. Our spirits testify that we are God's kids. We sing about it. We read about it. We, we pray to God, our Father or Father God or things like this. We talk about God as Father. And now the Spirit comes alongside us and joins in our heralding or, or, com- or confirming our um, stating that God is our Father. So when we pray our Father, the Spirit comes in and says, yes, He is your Father. When we sing to God about God's love, the Father's love to us, the Spirit joins in and confirms, yes, your Father loves you. The Holy Spirit comes alongside our Spirit, testifies together that we are God's children. It's actually awesome. The Spirit, I mean, chiming in, I'm trying to tell tell you that you will hear Him but knowing that he is confirming these truths that we know is an amazing reality to live in light of. 
We are God's kids. In case you missed the significance, Paul goes on in greater detail. He says, The Spirit himself testifies together with our spirit that we are God's children. And if children, also heirs. Heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ. I don't know if you, like your start to 2020 has been like particularly awesome. Maybe you were really looking forward to 2019 finishing and then 2020 brought bushfires and coronavirus and stock market corrections and um, Prince Harry abdicating. It's some... I mean, it's always tumultuous, right? We hear more news now than ever before. We have this great confidence, this great foundation that we are both in Christ and heirs of God. One of the things that I've actually found very interesting, I've never really been a big, like, uh, you know, royal watcher, but just hearing about the thing of, like, Harry saying, hey, Granny, don't want to really do the family business anymore, and hearing things like, okay, so will he still be a prince? Will he still get, be get to call like his royal highness or what will his title be? Uh, will he get money? Will people have to like defer to him in a particular kind of way as a royal? What does it mean for somebody who has a, an amazing inheritance, an amazing name, an amazing family to go, I don't want to be in that family anymore? And for us, our, our kind of trajectory is exactly the opposite where we are non-royals And the king, not just a worldly king, not just someone who's going to die, not not even just a good king, but again, the God of the universe comes to you and says, you are mine. Come into my family. Become my daughter. Become my son. Become an heir alongside your big brother Jesus. And it's better than splitting up the pie a few billion ways and each getting a a small, you know, slither of that pie. Uh, What Paul goes on to say is, because we are heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ, everything that Jesus is inheriting as the son of the father, having lived a perfect life because of his satisfying death applied to us, perfect life applied to us, satisfying substitutionary death that we deserved, having been paid on our behalf. Now we likewise will inherit everything that Jesus is going to inherit. It's not a slice of the pie. He inherits everything. And because we are in him, we along with him also inherit what he inherits. Again, this is why it's so important to realize that you being a daughter or a son of God is the most important, one of the most important things about you. It's the most important relationship you have. What is Jesus inheriting? It means what he gets, you get. His inheritance is continued perfect relationship with the Father. And that's, what you're, that's your inheritance. His inheritance is perfected body, and that's what you're going to get. His inheritance is, I mean, everything. The universe. And this might be a, a difficult thing to really receive and live in light of. Uh, Because we know how undeserving and ill-deserving we are of any of these things, which is why the gospel is so important to truly grasp that because Jesus is going to inherit these things, we will also inherit these things. And Paul goes on to say, his inheritance is glory and your inheritance is also glory. Not because you're glorious, not because you're awesome, quite in spite, because I'm awesome quite in spite of that, but because Jesus is awesome and his perfection applied to us, our hiddenness in him, meaning we'll also share in his glory. That's what it means to be a co-heir with Christ. What he gets, you get. He finishes that sentence like this. The Spirit himself testifies together with our spirit that we are God's children. And if children, which he says, you are his children. And if you're, if you're his children, which you are, then you're also heirs. Heirs of God 
and co-heirs with Christ, if indeed we suffer with him, so that we may also be glorified with him. Your inheritance is glory, but there is a sense in which, a reality in which that glory is also wrapped up in your sharing in his suffering temporally now in this life. He's not saying to the degree that you suffer, you'll be glorified. He's saying when you share in Christ's sufferings, because you belong to him, we are promised suffering. I was speaking with somebody yesterday who had abandoned the faith because they believed that if they believed in God and deferred to him and, and tried to live a life that God was asking of him, that God would owe him pleasant, comfortable, easy circumstances in this life. And when that didn't materialize, he thought, God, you've lied to me and I'm out. And in reality, God had never lied because he's promised, actually in the New Testament, over and over and over again, that because we belong to Jesus, we're going to suffer. But if we suffer with him, if we belong to him and suffer with him, we're also promised that inheritance of glory in him. Now, the next, like next week, it's all about this suffering and all about this glory. So we're going to like put a pin in here and come back next week. Sound all right? Let's pray together. Father God, I want to thank you that we can call you Father God. Thank you that you love us as a father. Relate to us as a father, a dad. Because of your Holy Spirit in us, you have gifted to us because of what Jesus has done, not because of our goodness. We can call you dad. We can call you father. And you, you are the magnificent, glorious God of the universe. It seems irreverent to call you father. And yet that's how you want to relate to us in adopting us as daughters and sons. And so we're so thankful. Help us, please, Lord, to live in light of this. Help us to receive this adoption. Help us to know, I mean, truly know what this means for us. May it influence and inform and direct our attitudes and our words, how we relate to one another, how we relate to the world around us, how we relate to our vocation, how we re relate to our finances, how we relate to our community, our neighbours, um, politics, everything, Father. Help it stem from this one truth that we are your children, because of your love for us. Father, help us to put to death the things of the flesh by the power of your Holy Spirit. Thank you for this community. Help us to even lean into this community as you, as you do this sanctifying work in us by your Spirit, that we would partner with your Spirit in that work in us, but also partner with your Spirit's work uh, of sanctification in others as well. Thank you for your scriptures. Help us to wield these as a weapon against the flesh and against the enemy. Father, in everything, help us to bring you glory, the glory that you deserve. We are looking forward to that day when we step into glory with you, receive that inheritance that I mean, we have done nothing to deserve. We don't want to pay you back for you, don't we? We can't, but we do want to live a life worthy of the name. So help us to this end. In Jesus' holy name, amen. For more great content, more information about City Light Church, or to donate to the work of City Light Church, visit us online at www.citylight.church.